Well, folks, welcome back to another Canada Immigration Live q and I'm here, Mark Holthy, with my co-host, Alicia backman Bahari. How are you, Alicia? I'm doing all right, Mark. Hanging in there. I, I think for some reason, you know, I think of this Garfield cartoon a long time ago. I don't know if anybody remembers it, but Garfield wakes up and he goes to his toaster and the toaster is broken and he goes to open the fridge and the bro- fridge is broken and he goes, you know, somewhere else in the house and then he runs and he says, I'm checking. And I was sure that today is the day after the warranty expired. And sure enough, that's what happened. So it's kind of feeling like what's going on in my house these days with the appliances. But um, yes. other than that, things are good. Yes. Oh, boy. Well, there's no shortage of change. There's no shortage of, uh, of movement within the world of Canadian immigration. And I think both of you and I knew that getting into immigration, that more so than probably any other area of the law, um, change would be a part of what we do, you know, within our firm, uh, very rarely do we maintain any kind of meaningful precedent system because by the time we develop it and roll it out, including the DIY courses that I do for the Canadian Immigration Institute, by the time we do that, usually the government then announces more changes or, or updates, or they, they switch out forms or whatever it might be, or, or major announcements like we experienced this, uh, this week. Some major announcements, in, including, and of course, right at the forefront is uh, the reduction in international students for 2024, uh, trying to reduce it down to about 360,000. So, um, Alicia, what are your thoughts on on this one? We'll start off right off the bat with this uh, a- attempt by Canada to stabilize growth and decrease the number of international students uh, or international study permits uh, issued. What are your thoughts mm-hmm. on this well, we- one? Well, just like you mentioned, Mark, we knew something was happening, right? We knew that there was a bunch of pressure building, um, that the provinces were needing to crack down on schools that were issuing degrees in a way that wasn't academically rigorous. Um, So there has been quite a bit of talk about this. There was a whole issue with, you know, um, students who are caught up in fraud and there's issues with unregulated foreign agents. So the federal government was under quite a bit of political pressure to try to remedy this. But of course, there's always a tension because the provinces have jurisdiction over how they regulate Mm -hmm. post-secondary institutions within every single province and territory. And so, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a maelstrom of about a bunch of different factors. And of course, having international tuition fees has historically and, and more and more over the years become a large source of revenue for schools in yes. Canada, and that feeds into provincial revenues. And so all of this is a puzzle with many pieces that if you're going to now <laughs> kind of pull the rug out from underneath it, it's going to have a bunch of ripple effects. And I hope, I hope that this will have the effect of really stopping foreign unregulated agents and consultants who are literally preying upon students and fleecing them of their life savings because now with a cap on those study permits and the fact that the provinces have to issue this letter um, of attestation it is now hopefully going to mean that people who are getting these letters of attestation are coming to legitimate schools that have rigorous academic standards. And that is important for quality control. Um, Absolutely. What I, yeah, what I do have a a problem with. Yeah, go ahead. mm -hmm. What I do have a problem with is what they've kind of snuck in with this announcement, which is the fact that people who are coming, unless they're at a post, like a, post degree, so a master's, a PhD, or a professional program, they're not allowed to have their spouses come and apply for an open work permit anymore. And I think that's going to be really detrimental to people who happen to be married. And if you're looking at coming to Canada for two years, most people are coming for two years, who's going to want to leave their spouse in their home country and or have their spouse just come to Canada and twiddle their thumbs for two years? I think that's really tough for people. Yeah. And it's so interesting, Alicia, because when you look over the last, well, year in particular, maybe two years, um, there's been a lot of talk about labor shortages and we need people to fill in-demand occupations and things like this. But I almost get the sense, Alicia, that they they feel that 
that these spouses that are coming are somehow taking jobs away from Canadians on these open work permits. And, you know, and obviously um, families need more space and, and our Canadian families and families of permanent residents, like it comes down to this housing. And the reality is it's like real or perceived, right? Government makes decisions based on votes. <laughs> they, they, they make decisions for, for political reasons as much as the reality of the situation. And in the past videos that I've done, as I've, you know, as we've talked about these recent changes, um, you know, they've alluded themselves as one of the justifications is increased demand on housing, healthcare, and other services. Now, to what extent um, you can say international students and the high numbers coming in are having an impact on that? Well, I'm not here to make any judgment on that because we've got open work permit holders that are coming in under a variety of different programs that are taking up space, whether it's Ukraine, whether it's the special measures for Iran or Hong Kong or wherever it is that the government, these new special measures that they're putting in place, anyone who comes in that is outside of the annual levels plans wasn't really planned for. And so um, I think they've reached the stage now, uh, whether or not, like I said, real or perceived, that they're, you know, they're, they're starting to take it on the chin and they're figuring, okay, well, we need to do something to curb this because public opinion is not going in our favor. And it's really easy to point a finger at, at, at um, you know, at international students when it's not their fault. You know, mm -hmm. these, it's like you pointed out at the beginning, it's these overseas crooked agents, you know, that are, you know, and, and the owners of these, of these private schools who are just fleecing people, creating these, uh, well, the minister defined them as kind of puppy mills and things like that, which are solely designed for the purposes of giving someone a study permit and then uh, getting them to to obtain a postgrad work permit, which is to some extent the the evil that the, that they're trying to accommodate for. And um, the the minister he he said specifically, uh, you know, from from this, um, and I was just pulling this up here. Those of you who haven't watched it, let's see if we can pull it up right here. This is the this is the video that he did when he was. Um, uh, basically, when he was uh, uh, announcing this, and then all the news reports and everything flowed from this, and then we had our our, our backgrounder. I'm just going to fly over here. So this one right here uh, on the YouTube channel, the CPAC channel, this is the video that he did. And if you want to go back and watch the videos, I think one of the feature videos on the YouTube channel is is my report on this. But um, you know, he 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 in the early early hours, they never like to give bad news at, at prime times. So early hours of the morning, he, he did this. And, uh, and then they made the announcement here in terms of how this is going to play out, but we don't have a lot of details. But in this video right here, Alicia, I just want to share just a short little clip with people so that they can see what is operating here and, and some of the mindsets and the things that are driving this. And corruption, unfortunately, is at right, right at the top of the mark. And I hope all of these overseas agents just get completely put out of business and, uh, and, and that because they contributed to this as much as, you know, the schools that house them. But just listen for a second here. Let's see if we can pick this up. Can we hear, can you hear that, Alicia? Mm -mm. Let's just see here. I just want to make sure that I have all of my audio going. Maybe we can't hear it. When I did my live stream before, I was able to do it. Okay, well, I'm not going to waste too much time. Basically, what, what he talked about is he, he talked about these bad actors um, that don't have the best interests of Canada at heart who attempt to game the system. And he said after two years, you know, um, someone said, well, how will the world look different from, from doing, you know, undertaking these measures? Um, that that's what he was asked. How how will the world look different? Let's uh, we'll get a little bit better of a image here of the minister. He's looking kind of weird there on the screen. Um, uh, he, he said it's a bit of a mess, okay. And he said, but but it's time now to rein it in. And he said these measures, you know, are are blunt. They recognize that. And I think us as immigration lawyers, as we dissect this, people always ask, did they go too far? Did they need to to do this? Were there other options? Well, the reality is they acted. They went forward. And uh, are doing, you know, what they feel is best. Um, he says they don't know if, if they'll get it right this time. But he also put blame on the provinces to do their part. And he, he said, look, the, the provinces have a role and a responsibility in, in 
divvying out these DLIs to these schools. Okay, so it's a it's a joint effort. And he says, uh, you know, the provinces are authorizing these fly-by-night schools. And then he gave an example of a sham commerce degree offered by a school that was located on top of a massage parlor where someone essentially goes um, and then they end up driving Uber. And he said, if, 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 if Canada needs a dedicated channel for Uber drivers, um, he says he can design that. But this isn't the intention of the international student program. And, and these are obviously egregious kind of really... Um, over the top examples, but but this is the the thing that the minister is, is wrestling with, and the, the department is wrestling with, and repeatedly, Alicia, I just I'm so frustrated with our industry sometimes because where there's a buck to be made, it just all of these people crawl out of the woodwork, and then they're just rampant for exploiting their own countrymen, and and unfortunately, that's kind of what we're seeing here. Yeah, I mean, I've heard terrible stories. I've talked with people who literally lost their life savings because some foreign agent who was not an immigration lawyer, who was not a regulated consultant in Canada, had basically sold them a story and then got access to their entire GC Key account, had all their personal information. They didn't know what was submitted. And so the the agent had submitted things, so they had signed blank forms. And then the agent filled all sorts of things in about what their you know, transcripts were and what school they were going to and what their study permit letter of intent was. And so this is really bad stuff. There's there's for sure fraud and, and even extortion in some of these cases. And that I'm absolutely for shutting that down. That that needs to go, that ought not to happen. Um, and if the only way to close the taps is really to to clamp down on the number of study permits from this end, then that is a blunt tool and that's what they're doing. Um, but I do feel for for some of these measures where, for example, you can't bring your spouse anymore unless you happen to be studying for a PhD or a master's or a professional program. So yeah. it is going to, I think the, the trickle down effect is that it is going to significantly make it harder for people to qualify for express entry because now you can't have your spouse working while you're going to school. Um, I guess it's okay if you're a single applicant and you're coming and you're relatively young and you're coming to do your education in Canada, but you better have perfect English, probably some French and maximum foreign work experience. Yes. And Along those lines of kind of punishing families and hi Spidey and the other people, I've just been kind of giving shout outs as we as we continue down this path. Express entry is the same as far as I'm concerned. And the the view they take in terms of applying through express entry, they really do punish individuals that have spouses. And this has been the beginning of express entry, and I, I can't think of any other way to describe it than punishing. Because generally speaking, in a, in a relationship, it's a rare occasion where both um, the, the principal spouse and the accompanying spouse have the same level of language, education, those kinds of things. And so we've known this for a long time that, you know, if you're an individual that's applying with a spouse, well, your core human capital points are going to be lower because 40 of your points are attributed to your spouse. Now, generally speaking, Canadian experience doesn't necessarily, you know, hit hit into the system. Like it, it, it's, it's not something that people generally have, although now more than ever, I guess, we're seeing that being a factor. So if your spouse comes and works too, you know, they can, they can get that. But, you know, with education and, and, and language, like there's 30 points. Sometimes it's a whole 30-point swing difference between them and an individual who's applying, you know, you can see on their own. So, uh, you know, I, they've got their, you know, I'm sure they've got their demographic reasons and, and the stats show that people that come as single individuals, maybe, I don't know, maybe they're more mobile, maybe they're upwardly economically more upward, upwardly mobile. I, I don't know. Maybe they it, then choose to, you know, enter into spousal relationships with Canadians or permanent residents and have better likelihood of settling. I, I don't know what the rationale is, but I've never seen one that's meaningful. And once again, the decision made that, you know, we're not going to allow, you know, spouses to come. And I guess, you know, we can, we can spend a lot of time speculating about these things, but one of the biggest um, misnomers, I guess, that people are sold, this bill of goods they're sold, is that you just need to have enough money to cover the first year, which in reality, that's what you need to demonstrate. But my goodness, you know, tuition is unbelievably, unbelievably expensive and the cost of living. And if you are planning on somehow working and covering the costs, well, 
some people would say, well, my spouse can work and they can help pay for tuition and our living expenses and I can work a little bit too. That's a dangerous, dangerous game to play. And uh, the, as far as I'm concerned, the department has only exacerbated that by saying you can work up to full time for some individuals over, you know, the last last stretch here. You can work full time while you're going to school. Well, I've got three kids in university right now. And I can tell you that if they were working full time jobs and trying to do well in their classes, good luck. And so people end up, you know, flunking out of their classes, not doing well. And when you don't do well in school and you're faced with the perceived glass ceiling of being a, a new immigrant or a foreign national looking for a job, it's really, really hard to succeed. And then what happens after that? People have horribly negative experiences. And then they say, is Canada this glorious place that, that I thought it was? And so I'm hopeful that you know, by reducing the total numbers, that it's going to be able to eliminate this corruption that exists. It's going to be able to put us back on the map because I don't think we're there anymore of having pristine education. And it's really tarnished it because of greedy, money-grubbing um, you know, individuals that, that are, like the minister said, that, that are just simply bad actors. Yeah, and Mark, we did see kind of the government trying to course correct for people who are planning their finances, right? So we saw earlier um, or a few months ago that they were saying, well, wait a minute, that cost of living and the the amount that you need to have for settlement funds was nowhere near in line with inflation. And so they revised that figure. And so that was one big thing a few months ago to pay attention to how much money do you realistically need if you're going to be a post-secondary student. So, you know, that all happened. And then along with that in December was the new forms, right? The 1294 actually was a new form that they rolled out that had to have a verification letter from the school. So that letter of acceptance from the school then had to be independently verified by the school. So they've been kind of mm -hmm. tweaking the system and pushing the yeah. system to try to recalibrate things for a couple months now. And this is now the, next the de definitive statement. Yeah, yeah exactly. So we know from this, one of, the, one of the challenges, and we'll bring this up for anyone looking to apply for a study permit right now, we're just dancing around this. Um, the, the minister has announced, in addition to the debacle they had with the actual acceptance letters, they've instituted some, you know, some direct communication between the department and the schools to make sure there's no fraud there. That was a bad situation that they experienced. Um, but you can see here, in, in order to manage the cap that they're placing on it. And just to reiterate, they're looking to, um, they're looking to stabilize growth and decrease the number of new study permits to approximately 316 in 2024. And we do not know what 2025 is going to look like. It could go up, could go down. But in order to manage that, they're going to issue it in a pro rata basis to provinces based on population. And I was looking at the statistics, and once again, if you guys go back and watch the videos that um, that I did uh, two days ago, um, you'll see that I, I, sh I pulled up some information uh, from I think it was Nicholas Kyung's uh, Star article on the the basically the percentage of study permits that are going to provinces. Now the data was back to 2022, but I don't think it's substantially different in 2023. We'll see that the official statistics haven't come out, but Ontario was receiving 51 percent. And I think BC at, at, I think was around 22 or 23%. And, um, you know, and then the other provinces were substantially lower. Well, this reduction, this pro rata reduction is highly expected to increase the available sl slots for some provinces where students don't go based on population, like even Alberta. If we go straight pro rata, it's, it's entirely possible that the number they're given is more than they're currently filling right now just because of the, the population distribution. So we'll see how that plays out. But if you're new and you're looking to apply for a study permit, we have a problem here. And this is the problem right here. And do you want to explain this, Alicia? Mm -hmm. So keep in mind that cost of living was changed. So you have to meet the new cost of living. Keep in mind that as of December 1st, you had to have a letter of acceptance verified from the school and federal government. Now, as of January 22nd, you have to have a letter from the province, which is going to be an attestation letter so that the provinces can allocate how many students they are going to have in the cap going to which schools. There's no process for this yet. So it effectively means that as of two days ago, 
nobody can get their study permits processed unless you happen to be a inside Canada renewing an existing permit or a minor, um, or unless you are going to a uh, master's, PhD, or a professional degree. So it basically has completely shut off study permits and they have said that as of January 22nd, 2024, if nobody has, if somebody doesn't have that letter of attestation from the province, their application is going to get returned to them. And they have, and this is the only place I could find it. So when you're, how to apply to study in Canada, you go to that link, it will take you here, who can apply and then get the right documents. And this is the only location at this stage that we've seen the, the, the department listed. So obviously the financial requirements, and Alicia, really, if we just touch quickly on the financial requirements, um, I think most people realize that, uh, you know, that they're very similar to what we'd expect for express entry. So um, there's, there's, they're, they're a little bit higher, a little bit higher in terms of the funds required, but, but, you know, these are like for settlement, it's, it's quite amazing, Alicia. Like if you look at the amount of funds that are required per year, part of the reason I think is because they don't expect people to work and, and, um, you know, as, and then if we go to express entry, so we go here, proof of funds, um, let's just pull this up here quickly and I'll show everyone. This is the interesting thing that I find. So if you go here, you can see for one individual, 13,757, right? Which is, which is yeah. taking into consideration their expectation is they're going to come and work full time and be able to provide for themselves, right? And so this is to kind of get them on their feet. Whereas for these figures, well, let me jump back to the right page here. I've got too many pages open here. Um, these figures are really designed to have someone be able to support themselves without the need to work. And, uh, Plus and tuition. Yeah. Plus tuition. Yeah. Not including tuition. Yeah. This is just, you know, recognition of housing costs and things like that. But it is, um, you know, I don't know what your thoughts are on this, Alicia, but uh, f f as far as the candidate pool, this, you know, the global middle class, you know, yeah, India has got so many because there's a large middle class in, in India that can, that can afford tuition, but you look at, and maybe China, right. But you look at other countries like African countries, like how in the world, you know, it's going to be really, really uh, prejudicial for them, but it doesn't change the reality that it's really expensive here in Canada. So what are your thoughts on yeah. that? Well, and I think it's it's fair and more transparent for the federal government to say, look at this is a realistic reflection of how much money people have to have in order to be able to survive for a year. And so over and above, like you still have to pay your full tuition up front for your study permit program. Um, but then you still have realistically about $20,000 to be able to afford rent, to be able to afford food and heat and cell phone bills and insurance yes. and everything else that you need. Um, that figure was low before, but it's because they hadn't revised a lot of their figures for immigration for almost 10 years. So, and they hadn't increased for inflation. And so one of the things too that people have noticed is that when you are paying fees, be really, really, really careful with your immigration fees because a lot of those fees have gone up to include the cost of inflationary um, influences. And so that's something that you've got to pay. And it's a new reality that it's affecting everybody in addition to and including the federal government. So I think it's more fair for the federal government to say this is a realistic figure for what people have to pay. And the tough reality is that it makes it less accessible to study in Canada for a lot of people who just don't have, you know, by the time you do your exchange rate conversion, yeah. depending on your country's currency, it can get tough. Yeah, it's like two years your annual income. Um, if we go down here, and uh, I think my audio is never quite loud enough here. Um, if, if we go down and just look here, I want to point out just so that there's no confusion, okay? So like Alicia talked about, these attestation letters, Quebec has already had this in place. So it's not, I'm just going to pull my mic up here so people can actually hear me. Um, the uh, Like Quebec has already had this in place. So so this isn't going to be anything terribly new for them. But for the rest of the provinces, they got to figure it out. I have to assume that they are not going to be waiting until the very last day to do this because the, the schools are going to be just screaming at them to put it in place. But, um, you know, it says most students need to provide an attestation letter. And that's true. And if we just look at this carefully here, you know, this is the page that you're going to go to for instructions. At least this is what it indicates. So you need to bookmark this page. And, uh, and it says here, we'll return any application received basically on or after January 22nd 
without an attestation letter unless you're exempt. And then they give the exemptions. If you're studying like a minor or if you're a master's PhD, we don't know what this means, post-grad program 100%. Uh, that hasn't been defined. Um, or understand if you're in Canada already studying, the ability to extend your study permit will be fine without this attestation letter. And what is silent with all of this extension is spouses, Alicia, that are currently here on postgrad mm -hmm. or on spousal open work permits accompanying students. I have to assume that they're going to be grandfathered in. I'm going to give IRCC the benefit of the doubt because otherwise they're saying, okay, now, all of you spouses who've been here for two or three years, you just have to go home. We're not renewing your work permits. And I guess well, they could do that, but that would be that would be really cruel um, I, if they I, didn't I grandfather it in. I wouldn't hold out high hopes. Like I think, and I see a couple people are asking questions in, yep. in the um, chat there, but I would say if you have a current study permit and your spouse is currently here on an open work permit and it's about to expire soon, make sure that you are applying sooner rather than later if you're eligible for your postgrad work permit make sure that you can prove that you're working in a job and that you actually have a, a letter from your employer and that your spouse apply for that open work permit as soon as possible yeah for sure you don't want to wait like if you have the ability you don't want to take a chance absolutely mm -hmm. all right so those are some of the crazy things you guys that are happening in the world of international students what are the ripple effects to express entry? Well, at this stage, we don't really know. There's so many people inside Canada that are going to continue to keep these scores high. So yesterday, January 23rd, we'll see if there's another one today. You know, if I refresh this page since I've loaded it up. Uh, okay, no updates at this stage. So, um, oh, let's see. No, 23rd. So 543 is the CRS. So it's still really high for general draws. And the number of, uh, of invitations for these general draws is consistently going to be small. It will. And we know why. The reason it's, it's that way is because of the, the targeted rounds. Okay, so they've done two general draws in January. They're probably going to shift back and do some more program-specific, uh, or I should say uh, category-specific draws. We'll see. But there's a lot more you know, streams to divvy, <coughs> divvy um, nominations out. This... We remember back in December was quite a big draw and you think 6,000 and it's still 481. So at 481, you still need something else other than perfect human capital. Now, technically, if you have a maybe a PhD, I guess that might put you up into this range. But, but generally speaking, someone who is applying, even if they were STEM outside of Canada, at 481, you're still in the upper upper reaches. You'd have to have just everything falling in place uh, if you didn't have some, you know, sibling in Canada or, you know, uh, work experience or international studies in Canada to, to hit that level. So we're still dealing with inside Canada for the most part here. Um, and, and we'll see how it plays out. French, mm -hmm. you can see French, okay? French is something if you speak, you, you have a chance outside of Canada. But otherwise, it's going to be really, really tough. Even general draws, this massive one. 561. So I don't know what your thoughts or speculation, Alicia, on, on what these changes to the study permit program could potentially in the future have on express entry. Most people I talk to say, oh, it's not going to have any impact. But I don't believe that. I think as, as things go forward, it will start to, to push things back down. Will it get to the pre-pandemic levels where it was in, you know, the, the, the high 460s to, to, to 470s where people can actually qualify? That's what I'm hoping for, but it may be a couple of years before we get there. Yeah, and I honestly think if the taps are being closed on using a study permit to get a postgrad work permit to gain Canadian education to then be able to apply for express entry, I think now more than ever and for the next few years, finding a good quality Canadian employer who's willing to go through that labor market impact assessment process. They have to prove they can't find a Canadian to fill the job. But if you are able to be the candidate that they need, those LMIA and employer spe specific supported work permits are going to make all the difference for people who are going to be able to get Canadian work experience or not. And there's going to be fewer ways to get open work permits. So 
it's now going to be really kind of skewing towards business immigration, which I think from a policy perspective is what the provinces, what the politicians want. They want to have more of an alignment with a labor shortage, skills shortage, and who they're bringing in for temporary foreign workers, and then who hopefully they're transitioning to permanent residents. So I think more than ever, having that really strong business immigration and having the ability to find a Canadian employer, that's going to be more important than ever. And again, whenever there's an opportunity for, you know, people to use this as a new pathway or a different pathway, there's going to be the potential for corruption. So be super, super careful that if you are working with any sort of recruiter, those recruiters cannot charge the candidate a penny. They are employed by the Canadian employers to try to find people to match up to a job in Canada. So, so be careful about that and make sure that if you are looking for a Canadian employer who's doing an LMIA, everything should be above board. Yeah. And one other thing I want to point out with this whole world of post-grad work permits. Now, we know that there's certain schools that they're really targeting. We don't know how it's all going to play out, you know, in terms of the whole private college thing. With the public schools, um, at this stage, uh, individuals should continue to be able to get post-grad work permits, depending upon you know the, the public schools that they're attending, universities, colleges. Um, but we'll have to see how it plays out. When I look at the number of um, workers in Canada, traditionally, when people are coming to go through these kind of public-private kind of college scenarios that the minister was talking about, and I just want to pull it up just to just to talk about it very briefly here. If you, if you go down here, they were talking about um, the post-grad programs and they were specifically addressing what they call these arrangements, a curriculum licensing arrangement. Um, these individuals, you know, will, these, these institutions will no longer be eligible for post-graduation work permits upon graduation when you go there. And then they talk about under this curriculum licensing agreement, Effectively, what happens, and you can figure this out yourself if you're in this situation, students physically attending a private college that has been licensed to deliver the curriculum of an associated public college. And these programs have seen significant growth in attracting international students in recent years, though they have less oversight than public colleges and they act as a loophole with regards to post-grad work permit eligibility. So what they're saying is that they're just, the, the schooling is secondary. That's not the purpose. The whole purpose for these is to come here, get a work permit and apply for express entry or to become a permanent resident. And so there's a lot of international students, Alicia, that truly come here just to study. And often at the master's PhD level, that tends to be, um, you know, to some extent, there's a large portion of them that don't intend to stay in Canada, that truly are coming to get a higher level education and go back to their home country. And so that's why I think, despite what other people are saying about, oh, it's not going to have any impact, I think the number of individuals that are in Canada looking to transition are going to be drastically reduced because of the government's decision to stop issuing post-grad work permits to people whose sole purpose is to find a pathway through to PR. And, um, you know, will it ultimately result in the, the CRS scores dropping significantly? Well, I don't know, because obviously a master's degree you're getting or higher, you're getting 30 points for your education and they tend to have higher CRS scores in and of themselves. But, um, but I think there's going to be a little bit of a settling effect when it comes to this. All right. Well, we've ha talked about a bunch of things. Let's pull up a couple of the super chats and see what we have going on here. So um, actually, I'm just going to pull this, our little heading down, if I can find it here. There we go. Okay. Uh, so um, first one is the B. The B says, uh, resident in Nigeria where PCC is valid for three months, my PCC was four months old when I submitted the FSW. Can that lead to rejection of my application? So um, we don't know if you were there in Nigeria when it was issued here, but Alicia, you want to tackle that one? Mm -hmm. So keep in mind that if you go to the IRCC policy on making sure that you have a valid police certificate for express entry, it'll tell you that some countries have expiry dates on their police certificates. But in terms of Canada's immigration requirements, as long as your police certificate was less than six months old at the time that you submitted it as part of your EAPR and you were not physically, you know, um, leaving and coming back to that country, then 
it should still be valid. They could ask you for a new one, but be careful, right? So this is where it says, if it was issued after the last time you stayed there for six months or more, um, and it's not for the current country where you currently live. So it really does depend on where you are living currently and where you were living at the time that you submitted your EAPR application. All right, Mickey's got a question here. Applied for a study permit extension three weeks ago and later realized the work history date was wrong. It didn't match the original study permit. Can I raise a web form and do I risk misrep? This is, this is one we get a lot of, a lot, especially when we start warning people about misrep and the consequences. Then a lot of these questions start to pop up. Yeah. And Mickey, so anytime when somebody's asking us, you know, can I do this? Should I do this? We always say book a consultation because there are a number of things that we need to talk to you about as lawyers to understand what's going on in your situation. But now that, of course, you can't submit a new study permit because it's effectively impossible to do so until provinces figure out what's going on the stakes are even higher and so i have had a, a few consults with people who did their own study permit did their own pgwp went to do their express entry and then realized oh no i forgot to put this or you know i didn't claim this unpaid internship and then what's going to happen and then if you had it on the initial study permit and you characterized it differently yeah there is usually a risk of misrepresentation if you're missing things or your work history dates don't line up or there's internal discrepancies and it is really important to correct it and to fix it properly but um there are always risks in doing so as well if if doing so causes your application um, to fall out of eligibility. So please book a consult and yes, you have to fix it. If, if there's a potential misrep on your file, you have to fix it. Okay, let's pull up this this other uh, super chat here, Pragya. This once again, I'm I'm gonna ring this, I'm gonna ring this little triangle. And that means you really should slide over, especially individuals that are asking these questions. Um, the, the question is, is simply this. I've got CRS 515. My post-grad work permit's expiring 13th of March. So we're a little over a month. Do I have any hope or should I just go home? And, um, and this is something that Alicia and I spend a lot of time with people. And, you know, when it comes to providing strategic advice, it is always, always better if people reach out to us early, early on. Because then we can actually strategize. And I think if you guys have watched a lot of the videos that we've done in the past, and especially listened to my advice more recently, I tell people to get the heck out of Ontario and BC. Go to a different province, right? And, uh, you know, and sometimes there's, depending on opportunities, there, there might be other opportunities that don't exist because of the 51% of all international students that are in Ontario, right? And uh, there might be other pathways in other provinces where even employers have a, a greater ability to apply and obtain a labor market impact assessment, which can open the door for you. And many provinces have very facilitative um, uh, TR, you know, foreign worker flips, we call them, for people that are working in those provinces to transition to permanent residence. But it's a, it's, it's a world now where many, many people are competing for just, so, just a fragment of the spots that you know, um, are, are available through the PNPs and, and there just is not going to be room for everyone. But we strongly encourage people to, to and the, there's always a link in the description no matter where you're watching this live stream. <clears throat> and we can help you to strategize. And sometimes our answer is, Alicia, that, you know, maybe sometimes Canada the answer, is, yeah. Yeah, sometimes the answer is, hey, if you have a, a good CRS, right, you're at 515, and let's say you have gained a year or maybe two years of Canadian full-time high-skilled work experience, and maybe you have some, you know, a sibling in Canada, or you might have gone to school in Canada, or any of those things, sometimes if you can't find a way to get an employer on an employer-specific work permit, it's probably or potentially going to be better for you to go back home if you don't have your full years of foreign work experience, maximize your foreign work experience, and then be able to update your express entry profile. And hopefully it's always a game because usually the age, as soon as you get older, your points go down for age. But if you can get your foreign work experience up, if you don't already have it, then sometimes that can more than offset it. So we always want to talk with you directly and understand the specifics of your situation so that we can provide you the best advice possible. Absolutely. Okay, let's whip through here. Um, Igor, are we having the meeting today? All right. 
<laughs> okay, let's jump through a few here. So this one's Angel's got a question about medicals, Alicia. If medicals are done for ongoing PR, are, um, if they're valid, will they be considered for SDS student study permit application or a new medical will be advised? So I think they've probably, I, I, I'm not sure, usually you don't get your medicals until you know you've got an ITA, but um, uh, what are your thoughts about the utilization of medicals for different, um, yeah, different uh, mm -hmm. Pathways. So, so double check, IRCC had a, a few different policies on medicals and when those expired and what, which, which ones could be used, whether you were using it for a permanent resident application or a, or a temporary resident application. Um, I would just say when in doubt, so SDS, Student Direct Stream, is very, very particular. And so if anything is potentially wrong in your SDS application, it's going to get refused. Of course, Angel, keep in mind everything Mark and I have been talking about today. If you're submitting a new SDS and you don't have a letter of attestation from a province, you're stuck. You can't submit that application until you actually get that letter of attestation from the province, which hopefully will happen sometime before March. But that's going to probably impact start dates for programs that are commencing in the spring session or, or maybe even the fall session. If in doubt, I would say get a new medical done, but go back and check the program requirements for SDS so that you are sure that you have everything in line when you submit that application. Yes. All right. Let's jump into a question from VK. And uh, this is in line with our business immigration series. So those of you who are watching this understand that we also have um, if I go back to our firm website here and you look at our blog and resources, we also have the Canadian Immigration Podcast here. And there's going to be another episode dropping 127 on C10 work permits. But um, we have a, a business immigration series. And uh, I'd encourage you guys to go check that out as well as Alicia and I for sure will do some episodes on this whole international student thing. And we've got some other ones coming. But these, uh, uh, the Canadian Immigration Podcast is your opportunity to connect in with us and, and listen as you're commuting the long commute into work. But uh, VK says, what does location of work mean on a closed work permit? Example, can I work remotely from my home in Red Deer for my employer located in Calgary if Calgary is the location of work? All right, so VK, I would say to be really, really careful here. And not only you, but your employer needs to be really, really careful here. Because if you have a closed work permit, that means that your employer either had to go through the Temporary Foreign Worker Program and submit an LMIA, a Labor Market Impact Assessment application. When the employer submits the LMIA application, they have to specify the NOC. And they also have to specify the wage for the location of work. And so if they specified the location of work as, as Calgary, and there's a different location of work in terms of you're working from Red Deer. And if the wage would have been different, that is a potential problem. The other question you're asking is, you know, there's a job title specified on that work permit, but the letters and the offer was un under something else. And I don't know what's been going on at the borders yeah. recently and the airports recently, Mark, but I have had a number of clients come through and I was very specific in helping the company um, put in their offers of employment, put in the cover letters, put in everything. Some of them are LMIA based, some of them are mm -hmm. through the um, employer portal through the IMP. But some of those officers are just saying, oh, well, you know, we're going to list whatever was in the system or we're going to um, just say Alberta NES. And that means that you can work wherever. It doesn't. And so it is so important for you when you are coming through the border whether you're at a land border or an airport, if your employer has said in their letter, your job is supposed to be account manager under this knock and the location of work needs to be Red Deer, that's what has to show up on your work permit. And if it doesn't, if your work permit is wrong, your employer and you need to correct your work permit or you can be working in violation, which is an offense under the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. So this is all very important that you fix and correct. And you can see here, he, uh, VK also indicated that the border agent messed up my work permit, says job title account manager, but my employer had letters and the offer was under key account manager. Am I in trouble? Uh, a, a slight word variation. Remember, you guys, sometimes the, the title that's pulled up is from the NOC too uh, when, they, uh, when they're producing these work permits. But Alicia, what are your thoughts on something, you know, a small yeah, I mean, distinction? Yeah, I mean, if it's... Yeah, if it's account manager versus key account manager, 
that may not be enough to change the wage or change the knock. But if you also have, you know, some wrinkles with the fact that the company is in Calgary, but you're working remotely, that should have been something that the company specified when they either did the LMIA or the employer portal offer. And so just make sure that everything is properly lining up there. Sometimes the change in title is in law school, we always call it de minimis, right? It's it's not enough to make a big difference or it's within the same realm. But if it changes your seniority and it would change your pay grade, then that is something that you might want to talk about. Yes. Shout out here to Anatoly. He says, sending my greetings to Alicia and Mark from London, England. Excited about my final moving back to Canada in May and completing my landing. Congratulations. Oh, we love getting those positive stories. All right. Priya says, I'm looking for September intake after my BALB from India uh, to do a paralegal program, I think. Do you feel which province is better to apply for? I brought this up because once again, you guys, this is a, Priya, you are actually in a perfect situation right now. This is where we like to have people come and book consultations. Like it's in these situations because we can look at your whole history. We can help you to devise a plan. And all you need to do is just click on the link, click on speak to a lawyer or probably pull you right up to this page and book a consult. And the reason that we say that is because, my goodness, there are so many factors at play here in terms of which province is better to apply for. But once again, with this new world we're in for, for study permits, um, just because you want to study in Ontario doesn't mean there might be room for you to study in Ontario. And even applying between now and March 31st, you're going to have to wait for those attestation letters. Um, but I tell people, Go to a province where people don't go. And, uh, you know, if that means Saskatchewan or if that means one of the Atlantic provinces, um, it just comes down to, 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 to going where people are not because there's going to be less competition if your ultimate goal is to stay. Yeah. And that brings up the fact too, Mark, that there is some room for regional regional and municipal kind of nominations. And so more and more, I think the provinces are trying to encourage people to settle outside of the major population centers. They're trying to encourage people to go. We have a federal, rural and northern immigration program. And we also have in some of the PNPs, we have these kind of um, rural renewal stream applications where people can go if that community is going to nominate them so it seems like this is the way that people are going or provinces are going and so keep in mind that it means you need to go someplace that is going to be a little bit um, less population dense usually yes um vicus says here i got a certificate of qualification so is it okay to move my foreign work experience from work history to personal history um due to a lack of of documents i don't want to claim claim it um you know, I mentioned this work experience in, in, in the study permit. So, so I guess I'm just, I, I bring this up just really quick because um, ultimately all, all of the stuff, if you guys have any questions about express entry at all, like the express entry accelerator, which the cart's closed right now, we're, we're going to open it up and it probably mid to late February here. Um, you can click to leave your email and get notified when, when the, the course opens up again. But, but this, these types of, um, of strategies, uh, you know, when it comes to work history, uh, claiming study history, there's a difference between claiming things that you want points for and a difference between um, clearly documenting your entire personal history. So, uh, you know, neither Alicia nor I can can tell you just from a, from this kind of a post what you specifically should do. This is the specific kind of stuff that makes Alicia and I really uncomfortable <laughs> because we don't know your whole story. But generally speaking, if you do it correctly, you can make changes between your what you put in your profile and what you put in your ultimate EAPR after you get your invitation to apply. However, you need to document it very carefully and any changes that you make must not affect your, your minimum entry criteria for whatever PR program you're going through, CEC, FSW, nor lower your CRS score below the round of invitation level in which that ITA was granted. So. Um, uh, Alicia, any other um, thoughts on well, that? Yeah, I'm just a little bit worried about the certificate of qualification because a lot of people think that they have points for a yeah. certificate of qualification when they don't actually qualify for a certificate of qualification. Keep in mind that certificate of qualification is for federal skilled trades categories. So it's only if you are within the specific listed knocks where you're claiming federal trade or you've got a red seal designation or you're on one of those 
um, listed occupations where you could possibly claim points for a certificate of qualification properly. So these are not for like professional designations for lawyers and accountants and CPAs and CTAs. Those are not um, things that would give you certificate of qualification points. So just be careful with that. I can't remember. I was just looking to see if we did a blog. We, it seems like we have a blog post on everything. I'll, I'll just flip back here. In addition to our podcast, our live streams, do not underestimate the value of what's in our um, our blog post section. And you can search the, the various topics. Um, yeah, we, there's constantly a steady stream of blog posts that are being po uh, pushed out that we do for our, our webpage. So, so please go and check those out, you guys. All right, let's go to a couple more here. Um, okay, uh, Culinary Nature and Adventures says, how do these new changes affect us as postgrads trying to get PR? And so those of you who are tuning in late or maybe you uh, were traveling back from another country that didn't have internet, um, <laughs> Canada has made some pretty sweeping changes for international students and for postgrad work permit uh, eligibility in some cases. Um, so this is where this question is coming from. Alicia, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, I think it's going to be so important to make sure that if you have graduated from a DLI with a PGWP eligible program that you are properly applying for your postgrad work permit as soon as possible. And then from the date that you have submitted it, so you have to stop working from the end of your studies until the day you submit your PGWP, make sure that you get your Canadian work experience, high skilled work experience as soon as possible. And it's always tough, right? It's I feel for students because as soon as they graduate, they have to hit the ground running. They've got to find an employer who's going to be a good employer who's going to be able to provide them a high skilled work experience job and then of course proof that they've worked in that job so that employer needs to provide a letter to confirm that you've worked there hopefully keep copies of your offer of employment your emails confirming what the job duties were so getting that canadian work experience is is going to be important because there are changes to the programs happening all the time and you want to make sure that you're capitalizing on what you so far know that you can get as much as possible all right, next question here. This one is from Retrage. Um, do you foresee CRS 492 general category would get an ITA before July 2024? Any updates on when CEC draws come again? Well, we've question. not had a CEC draw for a few years, right? Mark, it's, there has just not been a CEC draw. Um, so 492, it, it, it was 543 just yesterday. And before that, January 10th, it was 546. So that CRS has only come down three points in you know 12 days. So that is not a lot of movement. And if you take a look at the pool of, of applicants that are in there right now and their relative CRS scores, there's a lot of people that are sitting in there that have very high scores. So 492, stuff would have to move quite a bit further down for those general draws to come down to that point within the next you know, six months. Yeah. All right. Um, Akil asks another question. He says, the company I work for is not registered, but I have everything to prove my work experience. Would my work experience count? So once again, this is, this is something that um, becomes really, really challenging for us to say yes or no, because there are so many factors. If I jump back once again, and this is the, actually the express entry accelerator here, um, within this course, not only do we have modules for every part of the whole express entry journey, but module six is all about documents. And there are a variety of circumstances where you may not get a perfect reference letter or the company itself. It may be a little bit more challenging um, to, to be able to prove their existence. Now, when you say the company here isn't registered, uh, I don't know if that's incorporated, you know, in Canada, you can be a sole proprietor and uh, I guess can a sole proprietor then employ other individuals? I don't know, probably to some extent, but overseas in your country. Um, yeah, I worked for a company that's not registered. IRCC needs to be able to verify that your work author, you know, your work experience is valid. And, um, and uh, often when you look at the instructions, it specifically states provide a reference letter and pay slips or pay stubs if available. So in your situation, if we're going through here, and I'll just show you a little sneak peek of a few things. You can see we've got a ton of sample reference letters here in the download section, um, but I also have a record of employment checklist. And I'll just pull this in up and I'll just show people what's in here. 
the reference letter, if you're meeting all of these things, okay, and you have additional things like pay slips, tax assessment notifications, you know, bank statements, if, if, you, if you're struggling, if you don't have pay slips, well, that alone may be enough if an officer doesn't have any other reason to question. But if they try to find the company through like online, if there's no website or things like that, and they just can't locate the company, well, that can be a problem. So then you have to go to great lengths to, to provide whatever other evidence you can. And uh, I'll, I'll show you just highlighting in here, what if I can't get a reference letter, which also encompasses what do you do to prove if you, if you don't have each of these perfect, you know, uh, you know, items included, perfectly included in your reference letter. Um, the, this, this little tool that we have here um, is, is designed to get you thinking. And every person is different. It's a case by case scenario. And, uh, and so Akil, if you're struggling, like, yeah, register for, you know, to get notified when we open the card up for that again, book a consult with Alicia, you know, whatever, whatever options you, you, you feel um, might be a benefit to you, they're, they're available, but it's yeah definitely not an easy kind of, this is what you do. All right. We'll hit a few more and then we'll wrap it up here. Um, Okay, so here's an interesting one, Alicia. Mark says, or Marco says, if I got a notification from Ontario in my profile, can I make changes on my EE profile? I haven't submitted to Ontario, haven't got nomination yet, just notification of interest. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, what are your thoughts on yeah, that, Alicia? Marco, this happens um, a number of times. I've had clients retain me where they said, uh oh, wait a second, I got a notification in, of interest in the provinces or some of them like Ontario, where there's a two-step process where you have to register and then get a notification of interest before you can submit your application. If those are express entry linked applications, then yeah, you want to make sure if there's any problems or corrections that need to be done in your federal express entry profile, that you make sure to update it properly and correct it. But of course, IRCC can see what you have done in your profile. And so in most of those cases, I would want to talk to you about why why, what those discrepancies were, and then be able to write right away a letter of explanation, which you would then use when you're sub submitting your provincial nominee application. And then if you do get that nomination, you would mention it as part of your client information when you submit your EAPR. So you want everything to line up, but you don't want to be accepting um, and going down the road of a PNP nomination if you know that you've got problems with your Federal Express entry and those applications are going to be linked. Great. Okay, let's, we're just about done here. Um, I'm just going to bring this up because uh, Meka also points out the very obvious, not only with the fraud within the international student world, um, IRCC should go also go after the growing number of people selling LMIAs for a large sum of money. Okay, so this is where I'm going to be very, very critical of all of you. You guys are also a part of the problem. And as long as people are willing to pay for those, there's going to be a market for them. And unless people are willing to come forward and disclose this fraud that's occurring, then IRCC has no ability or, or the Canada Border Service Agency has no ability to go after people unless people come forward. And so understand that it's not just a matter of IRCC, but it's actually a combination of people refusing to bring forward evidence. So it's just, yeah, it's, it's just sad overall. There's a tip line, right? So if you hear of or if you have evidence of somebody asking to be paid for providing an LMIA, that is highly, highly illegal. And so you can go here, report fraud, report abuse. Um, if you think that there is something going on with the selling of LMIAs, then make sure to report it. So Canada Border Services Agency, CBSA, is going to investigate it, but they need people to give them the information so that they can start to try to track down who's trying to sell it. Are they related to any company in Canada or are they completely outside of Canada, foreign actors who are trying to take advantage? Yes. And the last, Connor, uh, last comment here is Gooner Boy. He says, hello, Mark and Alicia. Hope all is well. Love the government cracking down on fake colleges and consultants. However, process needs to be streamlined to protect legitimate students. I agree. I agree. And we will see how the, the details come forward. The devil's always in the details. And at this stage, we don't have anything more really than the, the basic background or information and, and news releases 
uh, that the government um, released. We don't know anything more than that. And and the, the, the little comments, let's see if I can find it here. Uh, I've got so many pages open here. Uh, I can't remember where it is. Anyways, um, um, yeah, it, the, the limited instructions that we have, there's very, very little for us to go off of. And so hopefully they can get it sorted out. They can strike the right balance and uh, yeah, and, and the world can kind of right itself and kind of correct itself because clearly they had to do something and it's, it's you know, there's always going to be people that are going to be harmed because of it, but we'll see how it plays out. All right. Well, thank you everybody for connecting in. We, we really appreciate it. Um, as always, we're back every morning, um, Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Mountain Time and uh, continue watching because the moment we get any kind of a program delivery instruction from IRCC on what a postgraduate program looks like, when the actual limitation on spouses, spousal work permits for, for international students, when any of those things come out, we'll definitely be going live to share that as quickly as we can. Um, as always, remember all of our other resources that are out there to help you guys. And there's a reason that Alicia and I do this. We do it, one, to give back, to help. We are a firm that loves to work with people, but we're not money-grubbing folks. And I had a, um, a, a, an episode that I did, and I'm gonna, I just want to uh, point this out on the YouTube channel. Um, and it probably, it, it's probably good to, to, to just share, um, just to let people know about it. I think it's still here. Let's see if I can find it. Um, I did it with, um, uh, let's just see here. Hmm. Live, should be on my live category here. Uh, right here. So I just did this just a, just a day ago. Uh, Canada and the Self-Employed Program, Systematic Refusals. Um, in my discussions with, um, with Pentea here on this class action lawsuit that she's doing, um, one of the things she brought up was that, you know, some of the firms knew that there were problems, but they weren't really paid to notify their clients of these perceived issues that they saw patterns with. Why? Well, because they're focused on money and that would have taken more time. And, um, and there's nothing that irritates me more when there are representatives out there that their sole purpose in existence is, is money. They're not out necessarily to look after the best interests of their clients their main focus is maximizing their revenues. And don't get me wrong, healthy immigration law needs to be solvent or Alicia and I can't help you guys. And do we love to have clients uh, hire us to, to help them with their applications? Yes, that is why we do a lot of this stuff, right? We want to show you and demonstrate, you know, our knowledge with immigration and to, and to help you to get to know us and trust us and like us, Right. That's the whole goal. And that's why we repeatedly tell people, look, you can book a consult with us. Click the link below. Um, if you if you want, if you're a true DIYer and you just need a little bit of help, well, our, our express entry um, process uh, with all of the other, you know, immigration supports that we provide is, is us, Alicia, myself, Igor, working directly with you with no middle people in between. You maintain and control of your applications. And finally, if you're a kind of a DIYer that, that wants instruction and just to learn and you love to educate yourself, the DIY courses are, are fantastic for that. And that's why, you know, I just revamped the whole Express Entry course, the 2024 version, um, over the holidays, over Christmas holidays and, and relaunched that. And so um, there's a ton of resources, blogs, like I said, the podcast, and it's all to help you guys to educate you so that you don't get duped so that you don't get into situations where someone says, oh, you know, and I had a consult just this past week where a consulting, um, a regulated immigration consulting firm um, based in Calgary, I think they were, um, were offering, I don't know, $17,000 uh, to get a job for somebody and, uh, and help them with their Atlantic immigration program. You know, there's all kinds of scams and these people are part of the problem. And until, you know, until the regulators clean it up, it's, it's going to continue to be messy. So our job is to empower you through education, teach you, educate you so that you can make informed decisions. And if you say, you know what, I just want a little bit of help, then you'll think of us first, right? That's why. So thank you, Alicia, for joining me today. Thanks for all of the things that you do to, to support the firm. And Alicia's an awesome immigration lawyer. See, I can say that about other lawyers. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a smooth talker, but Alicia, she's... She's smart. All right. 
Thanks, guys, and we will see you again next week or whenever I jump on live. All right, take care.